your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for you are our joy and prize to see the captive hearts released the hurt the sick the poor Well, good evening. This is Pastor Joe Wood of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church in Elkin, North Carolina, coming to you tonight. Uh, and very excited to be back with you. Uh, I hope you all had a great week. And uh, it's been a few weeks since uh, we've met online here. And, and I would just like to uh, say that we missed you. Uh, my wife and I had a great time of vacation. And uh, if you are part of the Pleasant Hill family, uh, you know Pastor Danny uh, shared the message Um and um, and the week before that, I, I believe I deviated from uh, our passage, or and so it's been a while since we've been back in Colossians, but we're going to be we're going to jump right back into Colossians chapter one tonight, and we're actually going to finish up Colossians one tonight. We're going to read verses twenty four through twenty nine. So as you're finding your place there, I would like to kind of tell you where we're going, okay? Uh, where are we headed in this wonderful uh, passage of Scripture? Well, for the next two to three weeks, I'm not exactly sure, but I can tell you that we're going to be discussing uh, what types of individuals that need to be in the church. Uh, there are there are the needs there are needs in the church. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, there is the need of the Holy Spirit. There is the need of the presence of God. But there's also a need uh, in the church that people that will put their hand to the plow and do the work that God has called them to do. You and I know that our pastor has been talking about uh, for quite some time on Sunday mornings, um, uh, he's been talking exactly what type of people need in the church and the, the essentials for every believer. Uh, if the Lord has saved you, my dear brethren, he has gifted you uh, with at least one gift uh, that is to be used in the church. However, uh, statistics tell us that we have 10 to 20 percent of the body of believers that are doing all the work in the church. So what does this tell us? This is telling us that one or two uh, out of every 10 are doing the work that God has called them to do. I want to ask you, is that you tonight? Are you laboring in the church for the Lord? So, as you found your place there in Colossians chapter 1, at Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29, let us read that together. It says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind uh, of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Let's pray one more time. Father, thank you for the, the night, Lord. Thank you for the blessings of this day. God, I pray now you would bless the reading and the proclamation of your word is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I have entitled the next two messages, Who Will Labor in the Church? Who Will Labor in the Church? And this is going to be part one. Tonight, this is going to be pointed toward the pastors of the church. Paul is writing here toward uh, the pastors of the church. And you say, well, good. I'm so glad that this is not going to be about me. However, I want you to see a couple of things from this passage that should make you feel very thankful and know that the pastor of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church is exactly what Paul was speaking about here in this passage. 
And so this should allow us to be very thankful for Pastor Danny. More importantly, we need to be thankful for what God has done through Danny Dodds to bring him over 15 years ago to us here at Pleasant Hill. So as I share with you, please pay close attention and see how these uh, points line up with not only Pastor Danny, but every man of God that is truly a man of God. Okay, so first we see here in this passage here that the church needs a pastor that will suffer for the church. As we think about the question, who will labor in the church, the first thing that Paul says here in verse 24, that the church must need a pastor that will suffer for the church. He says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you? I want us to see a couple of things when we see that. First, I want to see Paul's attitude towards suffering. Paul's attitude towards suffering. He says, who now rejoice in my sufferings. Paul, my dear brethren, had the greatest attitude toward persecution that he could. He literally rejoiced in the sufferings of Christ. As one commentator wrote, Paul was such a minister. He paid any price and went to any length of suffering in order to reach and grow people of Christ. He literally poured out his life. He suffered much, and the suffering he bore, he bore willingly for the cause of Christ and his church. End of quote. This makes us ask the question, how could one rejoice in suffering? The reason that Paul could sit there and say, I rejoice in my sufferings because he knew that he was doing exactly what the Lord desired for him to do. He knew that as Jesus Christ suffered, he did it laboriously. He suffered every facet uh, that was possible. He suffered fatigue, exhaustion, and everything for you and I. As Paul desired to be as close to Christ as possible, that's why he could say, even though I am in this prison cell, even though I may lose my life, I am doing what Christ has commanded me to do, and praise be to him, I rejoice that the Lord has used me through it. But then... We must look at a second thing, and that is, as he suffered, who was his audience that he rejoiced to suffer for? Paul's audience for suffering was you and I, my dear brethren, for the church at Colossae. He says, for who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. So Paul was saying he suffered not only for himself, but for the church. Hmm. Does this sound familiar? And Jesus Christ suffered for you and I. As John Phillips writes, Christ's sufferings are of two kinds. Christ has suffered for our sins, that suffering took place on the cross, and that suffering is over forever. He died. He rose again. He ascended on high. And now Christ suffers with his saints. And that suffering goes on and on. Christ suffered for our sin. That was redemptive suffering. Christ suffers with his saints, and that is responsive suffering, end of quote. Paul, my dear brethren, was doing exactly what the Lord had called him to do. He suffered for Christ, for himself and others. He was suffering with Christ, and so that you and I could have a better life. How selfless, how sacrificial and loving that he was displaying to the church at Colossae. He was displaying to the whole world that it wasn't about himself, rather all about others. Jesus Christ had made a big change in the man that saw before Paul, and now because of his change, he thought of others more than himself. He longed to see others saved and changed by the same gospel and power of Christ. So, to do that, he went to the point of suffering for them. Listen, we need men of God that will suffer uh, for the cause of Christ. They will set the example like the wonderful pastor that was thrown into prison in Canada because of COVID-19, uh, because he wouldn't shut down the church. That man is exactly the type of man that Paul was describing here and that you and I need uh, in the church. John fifteen twenty says, Remember the word that I say unto you, the servant 
is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So my dear brethren, the church needs a pastor that will suffer. Secondly, a church needs a pastor that is chosen by God. Look here in verse 25. He says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. So we see here that we must that the church needs a pastor that is chosen by God. Now, the dispensation there, um, the word there refers to the steward who oversees the household and property of the owner. The minister is the steward of God, the person chosen to oversee the house or church of God. So Paul was made a minister by God. There is no question about that. There is no doubt that we can see that Paul was ordained and governed by God to be a minister of the gospel. How do we know this? Obviously, by the life that he had lived. No man that is not called by God would suffer, be sold out, or, or go through the things that Paul did. Paul was not in the ministry for a lot of reasons that are some today. For example, Paul was not in ministry because it was a good profession. Paul was not in the ministry because his friends thought that he should. Paul was not in the ministry because of his natural talents. And finally, Paul was not in the ministry because of his father. No, Paul was not in the ministry for none of those things. Paul was in the ministry because he was ordained and called by God. You know, I have told the church this, but before growing up in a pastor's home and having a grandfather that was a pastor, I'd always got the joke from everyone that I was that I was going to be a pastor as well. However, pastoring was as far away as everything that I wanted to do in my life. If you know, if you are from the church, you know I wanted to become a meteorologist, and which I did. I I, be, I became a meteorologist by degree from UNC Charlotte. But it never worked out for me because I had a higher calling upon my life. Listen, ministry is not for everyone. If one is truly not called in ministry, they will never make it. They will never have the strength that they need to face the trials that we have to face, especially in the last couple of years. But I want you to know, without God, I can promise you, you will not be able to make it. But if you are truly called by God, God will give you the boldness. He will give you the strength. He will give you the joy. He will give you the compassion. He will give you the love that only comes through Him and by Him so that you can make it through ministry. And so, my dear brethren, Paul was called by God. He was a minister made by God. But Paul was to minister and preach the Word of God. Listen, what is the purpose of preachers? He said, there in verse 25, to fulfill the word of God. Griffith Thomas says that the minister is to complete the message of God's grace, that he is to put his whole soul into the divine gospel entrusted to him. Matthew Henry states this, We are Christ's ministers for the good of his people to fulfill the word of God, that is, to preach it. Matthew 10 and 7 says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 16, 15. And, and he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we've seen here, first, that the church needs a pastor that will suffer. The church needs a pastor that is chosen by God. Thirdly, I want you to see, the church needs a pastor that preaches the entire word of God. A church needs a pastor that will preach the entire word of God. What does it say here in verse 28? Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What does this tell us? It tells us three things. First, a pastor must preach Jesus. Men of God are always taught to preach Jesus Christ. Any minister should preach at... Um, any, any minister should, should preach a person, not things, ideas, no matter what. We are to preach Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Why? 
Because Jesus Christ is the only one, the only person that can and will change a life. Jesus Christ is the only one that we need to be preaching about because He is the one that makes the difference in our lives. Men of God, I want to reiterate to you that we are literally nothing without God. When we start preaching any other ideology or opinions, we have lost our way and calling. Jesus Christ commanded us that we uh, throughout the entire world should preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't preach our opinion, but preach uh, uh, thus saith the word of God. Some people say, well, don't it ever get old preaching about the same person? Well, I want you to know, if Jesus Christ came into your life, my dear brother, he changed your life forever. And because of Jesus Christ coming into your life and, and changing your life, it never gets old preaching about the one that gave me a life in heaven, the one that gave me life a life eternal but because of Jesus Christ. So no, it never gets old preaching about Jesus Christ. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, my dear brethren, not only does the, the church need a pastor that will preach Jesus, but secondly, the church needs a pastor that will warn every man. He says there, And we preach, warning every man. Listen, Man must be warned. One cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven without Christ in their heart. As preachers outline in the Sermon Bible states, he says, He must trust and obey God's only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He must surrender his life to Christ and let Christ enter and control his life, or else he will be doomed to separation from God eternally. A person can't live a life separated and apart from God and then at death expect to enter God's presence. If a person lives a life separated from and apart from God, then he will continue on separate and apart from God, continue on eternally. End of quote. The decision is up to every man, my dear brethren. Man must be warned, warned by the person whom God has chosen to warn him, and that is the minister. My dear brethren, every minister that names the name of Christ must have the boldness and compassion of Paul. We must teach the hard passages like Daniel and Revelation and, Mar and Matthew 7, 21 through 23. But we must do it with compassion and love. And this is the problem in the churches today. We have pastors that, that will want to just tinkle everyone's ear and not hurt anyone's feelings. A true man of God only has one man in sight that he worries about, and that is God. When a man of God worries about uh, a person, a, a, a individual other than God, Creator God, he has lost the vision and true calling upon his life. We must not worry about man, but preach from Genesis to Revelation the words of Almighty God and warn that there is coming a day that judgment will uh, come upon not only this land but this world. And for those that have never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior will be doomed to eternal death, eternal uh, uh, damnation in a place that nobody, that nobody wants to hear, but it is hell where they will be tormented, where they will be... Uh, uh, well, they will burn in the lake of fire. That is the warning that must take place from every man of God. I want to remind you of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. It says, Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the call upon every true man of God. Preach the word, my dear brethren. Finally, um, a church needs a pastor that not, will not only preach Jesus and will warn them, but finally will teach every man. He says, Teaching every man in all wisdom. It says there, uh, teaching every man in all wisdom. Every minister must teach the truths of God's word to his people. Yes, people are supposed to learn on their own. However, it is the responsibility of the man of God to make sure his sheep are being taught from the shepherd. And so finally, not only does the church need a, a pastor that will suffer and will uh, that is called and is called by God and will preach the word of God, but finally, a church needs a pastor that uh, will uh, labor and work for the Lord. 
the word uh, in verse 29. He says, Whereof, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his word, which worketh in me mightily. The word labor means to toil and to struggle in labor and work to the point of exhaustion, fatigue, and pain. There are many, and I say many men of God right now, that are physically, mentally, and even some spiritually tired. They have worked as much as they possibly can. They have tried to do everything they could in the last two years to make everyone happy, to do the right thing for their congregation, and they have ran out of energy. They are truly what Paul was talking about here. Men of God that have labored and will continue to labor and work to the point of exhaustion, fatigue, and pain. Paul did it. Timothy and others from the Word of God have taught us to keep on pressing on, keep on doing the work that God has called us to do, because at the end of the day, we can lay our heads down on the pillow and say that we've done all that we can for the cause of Christ. You, We've left it all out there for Him. Would you say that? Would you say that? Can you say that? I trust that you can. As men of God, but not only men of God, but people in the congregation that name the name of Christ. So in closing, I first want to say, if you are a member of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, be thankful for the the, that the four subpoints that I mentioned here we can all say about our pastor. He is not only he is chosen by God, he is willing to suffer for the church. He preaches the entire word of God, and there is no question that he labors and works to the point of exhaustion. That is our pastor. That is Danny Dodds. Be thankful and blessed, my dear brethren. And then secondly, this can relate to you as well as members of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. The church needs uh, people that will suffer. The church needs people that uh, that are going to labor and work and willing to live out the entire word of God in their lives. Are you doing that? Will you be willing to do that? If Jesus tarries and nothing happens, I want you to know next week when we get into Colossians 2, we're going to see even more about how the church needs people that will labor for the Lord. In closing, I want to end in a passage. It says, John chapter 9, verse 4. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The night is coming. We must work now before it is too late. Jesus Christ is coming, and I trust that you know him. And if you do, you are doing what God has called you to do. Until next time, listen, Lord willing, we will be in-house next Sunday night, and we're going to continue looking here at this wonderful passage and as we think about who will labor for the Lord. God bless you.